Good morning, everyone. I, I want to start to, by saying that I am humbled and honored to serve in the music ministry of this wonderful church. And I thank you for that opportunity. Samuel and I are here this week to discuss the worship service and the role of music in the worship of the Almighty God. Our text is entitled, What is Worship Music? Not everyone will agree with the answer to that question, and there has been controversy about music in worship all through the centuries. On page five in the second paragraph, the author writes, one would expect churches that claim to value the authority of scripture to follow biblical principles for worship, but do they? And is there anything that we can learn about biblical worship from church history? The reformers gave great attention to liturgy, carefully considering worship elements and their order. So yes, we can learn from church history. Let's first consider the influence of the Protestant Reformation in 1517. The use of music in the Christian church changed radically as a result of Martin Luther and the Reformation. Prior to the Reformation, the people had little or no opportunity to sing in the Roman Catholic services. In addition to theological changes, Luther made two primary changes to the worship service. First, he believed strongly that the service should be in the language of the people instead of Latin, and that included having the Bible translated into German as well as the other European languages. Because Gutenberg had just invented the printing press in 1450, Bibles could be printed and made available for the people to read for themselves in their own language something the Roman Catholic Church had prohibited, and lay people were even burned at the stake for reading the scriptures. That's something very, very hard for us to imagine today. The second change that Luther instituted was having the congregation sing hymns, something virtually all Protestant churches have done ever since. Since this was a new idea, Luther and his colleagues had to write both the words and the music for these new hymns. The most famous hymn written by Martin Luther, both the words and the music, is one you know and sing frequently. Can someone tell me what that is? A mighty, a mighty fortress is our God. And he wrote both the words and the music. Luther also had the choir sing in the services, and they would often sing arrangements of these new hymns to help teach them to the congregation. Having the entire congregation sing in a worship service, often in large cathedrals, meant that there needed to be some accompaniment. A full orchestra at every service was, of course, impractical. So the small pipe organs that had been used in the Roman Catholic services just to accompany the choir were greatly enlarged, and the German Lutheran churches built very large pipe organs to accompany their very large congregations when they sang hymns. Over the centuries, out of all the musical instruments in the world, the organ has become an instrument that is exclusively associated with the church and with Christian worship. Martin Luther, a musician as well as a theologian wrote these words, music is a gift of God, not a gift of man. When we consider all of the activities in our church, Sunday school, Bible studies, new member classes, etc., the central focus of any Protestant church is still the worship service. This is the one event every week where the entire congregation meets to worship the Lord together. In virtually every Protestant denomination, music has been a major portion of the worship service. And in fact, in most churches, music usually amounts to approximately 50% of the whole time period of the service. Now, before we discuss anything about music in worship, let's think for a moment about a more basic question. Why 
do we even have music in the service at all? One reason, of course, would be tradition, right? Um, which we have just discussed. Music has been a major portion of virtually all worship services around the world for thousands of years, including the liturgy of the early Christian church, as well as the Hebrew worship long before the birth of Christ. But we all know that tradition alone is not a good reason for doing anything. Another reason is that music can emphasize the key words in a scriptural passage, repeating them and making them easy to remember. In addition to coordinating the emotion of the passage with a similar emotion and musical style. As you know, the vast majority of the choir anthems as well as our congregational hymns are either direct scripture or a paraphrase of scripture. So, we are singing the word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not entertainment. Another reason for music in worship would be to allow the congregation to participate through the singing of hymns and through participation in the choir. As we have just mentioned, that was very important to Martin Luther, who permanently changed the course of music, church music history. Obviously, there are countless reasons why we have music in the service, but what do you think is the most important reason? I think the most important reason to have music in our service is also the most important reason to do anything. And what's that? Because the Word of God tells us to do it. The Bible is the instruction manual for our lives. So let's look at some familiar biblical passages about music. Psalm 100, verse 2, come before his presence with singing. It's not just a casual remark, it's a command. It says, come before his presence with singing. And in the Psalms, that is just one of hundreds and hundreds of references to music. In fact, if you take all of the Psalms, it's about every other Psalm says something about music and, and particularly singing. Uh, in the Gospel of Mark, the 14th chapter, the 26th verse, it says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So Jesus himself sang with the disciples at the Last Supper, and obviously, because of the casualness of that remark, um, they sang many other times as well. In Acts, the 16th chapter, verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. At midnight, if you were in a horrible prison, and they were much worse back then than, than we have today, um, would you be singing praises to God, especially if you'd been thrown in unjustly? But Paul and Silas sang hymns at midnight. Ephesians chapter 5, 19, again Paul writes, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. And this is repeated almost verbatim in the book of Colossians in the third chapter. And then in Revelation, the fourth chapter, day and night, they never cease to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And we will sing that song later in the service today. Yes, there will be singing in heaven. Isn't that exciting? Exodus, uh, the 15th chapter. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. They had just crossed the Red Sea, uh, fleeing from the Egyptians. And what was the first thing they did? They sang. Zephaniah, the third chapter. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, and he will joy over thee with singing. You know what that means? That means God himself is singing in joy over us. 
Genesis, the fourth chapter. And his brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all, as such handle the harp and organ. And therefore, there was music at the beginning of time. Jubal was only a few generations after Adam. After Adam. We think of music as being something later, but obviously there was a lot of music way back then. Uh, about a third of the Psalms begin with the inscription, and you can check this out in the Bible, to the chief musician. And many of them are titled, A Song of David. So that means that the Psalms were definitely sung in the Hebrew liturgy. The Westminster Catechism begins with, Man chief's, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. In other words, we were created to worship Him. The first four commandments are all about the worship of God. And Christ summed it up in the great commandment, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we worship, in both music and the spoken word. Now, we have established that we definitely should have music in the worship services, but what kind of music is appropriate? Let's turn back to our booklet, and in the third paragraph, Dr. Jones writes, somehow we have come to define worship services almost exclusively on the basis of musical style. Quote, contemporary, traditional, blended, or classical worship services receive their labels from the type of music included. Should we derive our music from the secular world, or should church music be something that's unique and different from the secular world? Should it be based on historical tradition, or should it be based on pop popular culture? What instruments are appropriate in worship? These are questions that need to be discussed. At the bottom of page six, he writes, church music is adrift in a sea of trends blown about by the wind of every opinion. On page seven, Dr. Jones writes, based on biblical evidence, music properly fulfills three roles in the context of worship, praise, prayer and proclamation. Praise is the lauding of God for his acts and attributes, acknowledging his supremacy in all things. Prayer is communication addressed to God. Proclamation encompasses any activity that proclaims the word of God. Quotation, ex explanation, teaching, and preaching. Praise, prayer, and proclamation are the roles of psalmody and hymnody, of vocal music, and instrumental music. When worship music is properly fulfilling these roles according to biblical principles, discord dissipates, unity increases, and the spirit utilizes music for its highest purpose, for man's chief, chief purpose to glorify the triune God. For our worship service to be biblical, it must find its themes, principles, and qualities in Scripture. Samuel will continue discussing in more detail about these three characteristics of praise, prayer, and proclamation. I must finish with my most favorite passage of Scripture. This one is from 2 Chronicles in the fifth chapter, and this is about the dedication of Solomon's temple. Now just think back and imagine this. Imagine this in your minds. All the Levitical singers arrayed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres stood east of the altar with 120 priests who were trumpeters. Can you imagine that? 120 priests who were trumpeters, and obviously there were even more singers, and it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for he is good, <coughs> for his steadfast love endures forever. And listen to this. The house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. If there ever was a description of the word awesome, that's it. The fourth commandment of God tells us to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. At the New Presbyterian Church, that is what we try to do.
Now, this Sunday service may not be quite like the dedication of Solomon's temple, but we will hold that up as our ultimate goal. Thank you for listening. Good morning. How are you all doing? Are you all awake? <laughs> There's coffee over there. So, um, now that John has talked about uh, music in worship and what it is, I think we can step back a little bit and just talk about more broadly what is worship, and we term it here reverent worship. That term was something that we talked quite a bit about with uh, Reverend Carter. Um, worship is, is comes from, there's many different styles of worship, different traditions, and everyone has their traditional form of worship. If you're a Lutheran uh, in Germany or North Europe, you're one. If you're a Lutheran in, in Minnesota, you have one form. And it's for all of the various sects of Christianity. So tradition is a bit of a broad and a nebulous term. So as we talked about worship and we looked at scripture, uh, I think Reverend Carter rightfully went to the root of it is we want reverent worship. And that, that is, if we start from that particular standpoint, I think it really affects and directs all that we do. So uh, before we go any further, I think we should discuss what worship is. What is worship? Well, Psalm 29, one to two really tells us quite succinctly. It says, give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. In scripture, the word worship is both uh, used to describe uh, different types of activity. Uh, specifically, it can be uh, something that we do in our services, our worship services on Sunday morning in the Old Testament would have been the temple, or it can also be uh, in the way we live our lives. And so worship, it, it should affect everything that we do. We live in a time when we like to compartmentalize everything, but certainly Christianity, that's a tendency. We, we do the Christian thing on Sunday morning, we get, the, you know, we get stamped at the door on the wrist, you know, we are Christian, and then you go out and you live your life, and it really doesn't affect it. Now, obviously, in our church, we, we really don't want to practice that, though I think all of us as fallen human beings uh, certainly do that to a degree. But when Jonah said, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land, he was really speaking there uh, about his whole manner of life. In contrast, in Psalm 100 we hear, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful songs. So here the psalmist is really talking about a specific activity of praising God uh, and would be perhaps more in the term that we use it today. These two concepts of worship correspond to the two ways in which we glorify God. To say it a bit differently, worship is declaring with our mouths and our lives that God is more important than anything else in our lives. Worship is about what we value. We are saying that this person, the triune God, is what matters most to me. It is what I value most in my life. Worship really is declaring what is most valuable. Everyone. Uh, the religious and the non-religious have an altar at which uh, they worship. Every altar has a throne. So how do you know um, who you are worshiping? Simply, we follow the trail of our time, our affections, our energy, our money, and our allegiance. At the end of that trail, you will find a throne, and whatever or whoever is on that throne is what we uh, then hold in highest value. In the modern church, I think it is often that, uh, true that we lack a real understanding of what worship is. It is not uncommon to hear someone to talk uh, and distinguish, for instance, between the worship and the sermon. You might hear someone say, we had a great time of worship this morning, and then the pastor gave a really practical message. No matter uh, how innocent uh, or common this mis misconception is, that statement really reveals a lack of understanding of what worship really is. In that concept, worship stands for more of an experience and probably the music, the, the moving songs that the, uh, they heard made the person feel closer to God, and so that portion of the service is associated in the heart and mind with worship. We don't come to a service of worship uh, to experience or to be deeply moved or by singing or have some kind of a, an emotional catharsis. In our society, we tend to place emotion above anything else. And when you feel something deeply and maybe even well up or 
so on, uh, that is a form of, that was deep worship. And uh, that, that is not, uh, that can be the case. The Holy Spirit can move us to, to great feeling, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that something emotional uh, is, 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 is the main goal of what we do. We come to meet with God and to give him the glory due his name. In biblical worship, we focus upon God himself and his unique worthiness. If we come for any other reason, then, then we have not worshipped. So this is the highest uh, question that we must answer. Why do we worship? Because the glory of God is the most important thing that we can attain unto in creation. So we'll let, now that we've talked about what is worship and, our, and reverent worship, what are the elements or the components of worship? Well, we read the Bible in worship, we preach the Bible in worship, we pray the Bible in worship, and we sing the Bible in worship, and we should also see the Bible in worship. So what does that mean, to read the Bible in public worship? Well, Paul told Timothy, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. The public reading of the Bible has been at the heart of worship of God since the Old Testament. It is the reading of God's Word in which he speaks directly to his people. We preach the Bible in our public worship. Preaching is God's prime in instrument to build his church. Paul said, faith comes by, hearings in Rome, uh, by hearing in Romans. Faithful biblical preaching is to explain and apply scripture. This means expository and evangelistic preaching squarely based on the text of God's word. The noted theologian Hughes Old reminds us that from the very beginning, the sermon was supposed to be an explanation of the scripture reading. It is not just a lecture on some religious subject, it is rather an explanation of a passage of scripture. We pray the Bible in our worship. Jesus said that his father's house is a house of prayer in Matthew. Our pastoral prayers ought to be permeated with the language and thought of scripture. We also sing the Bible in our worship. Scripture is full of examples and commands to sing in public worship. You heard John uh, mention some. What is meant by singing the Bible is that our singing ought to be biblical, filled with its language and theology. This is a very important issue. Uh, there are plenty of hymns, new and old, that really do hold to this high standard, um, but not always the case. In every generation, you have different quality of hymn writing that is taking place. We tend to relate to music on a cultural and a generational way, and sometimes uh, there's music that transcends that. Uh, one of the uh, favorite nuggets of the past that you hear on Sunday evenings and hymn sings is, is in the garden. Um, but if you look, for example, at that wonderful nugget, uh, there's, you know, there's not a whole lot of biblical foundation to that text. But we enjoy singing on a Sunday night. It's probably not going to be our opening hymn on Sunday morning, however. Uh, and the same applies to newer, uh, more contemporary music as we talk about. Uh, over time, the music of the 70s and 80s and the 90s, and each generation, you start to see the, the music that comes out of that, and that is of merit, so that people of the next generation also relate to it. Uh, there is a place for music of, a t of the time that we can sing, but then there also has to be that standard hymn book that we pass down from generation to generation. And so history has a wonderful way of filtering out uh, the music that should continue and the, the hymn texts. And finally, we said we should see the Bible in our public worship. That is, we should observe the sacraments in public worship. The sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper are the only two commanded ordinances in the Christian worship that we in the Reformed world believe in. And then we see our, with our eyes the promise of God and the reading and preaching of the word, God addresses our minds and conscience through his hearing. So any questions uh, about what we've been through so far? Any questions? Okay, I'm happy to keep rattling on. <laughs> so now that we've talked more broadly about what worship is, let's, let's talk about what is worship music. And this is this is, of course, always an important topic uh, today uh, and, and is one that must really be examined uh, from a biblical rather than an, uh, a perspective that's not objective. So I think we would agree that the state of uh, music and worship is, is sometimes um, controversial uh, and 
many times uh, we feel it's rather bleak out there. I think that's, that's true. And so how do we navigate through this muddle uh, back to solid ground? We must, of course, search for the answers in God's word. One of the things as a musician I've been thinking about a lot about lately uh, is aesthetics. Music, like art, is an aesthetic. The definition uh, of aesthetics is, quote, a branch of philosophy dealing with the nature of beauty, art, and taste, and with the creation and appreciation of beauty. We live in a very relativistic society today, and so uh, if you watch television of, in any manner, uh, even a, a conservative network like Fox News, it's amazing how relativistic everyone is, and you hear terms like that my belief system or any number of these catchphrases that everyone's using. And it's amazing how when you throw away the, the absolutes of God's word that people establish other absolutes. So right now an absolute thing is, is uh, that the worst sin is that if you are not tolerant. So therefore people are intolerant of people who are intolerant of something. It's, it's very fascinating when you watch uh, the way we set up laws and uh, you have the PC police. So we live in an age where relativism is everywhere and it infiltrates all of our minds. And so it's, it's hard uh, to not have that effect, of course, the church. In the church, in evangelical circles, we intellectually hold to absolutes in our theology and what we preach. However, for many, many, many years, I think in generations, aesthetics are, are viewed as a place where you can have relativism. And I don't believe that that is indeed the case. I'm not saying that we should all agree that the same thing is beautiful. However, it is possible uh, to, to be able to find standards by which artistic creativity may be measured. It is not merely just a matter of taste, but we can actually measure things. God is the creator of all things, and he is an absolute God. He created man in his image, and we are creative beings as well. Ultimately, God himself is our aesthetic standard. We are to imitate him with our own creativity. We are to do things with excellence to the best of our abilities. Currently, uh, as we all know, the church is going through what is described as worship wars, one of the frequent statements that is made in error is that contemporary music cannot be evaluated by objective artistic standards and traditional music as well. Uh, that is, and that music really is a matter of taste. And, and when you, we talk about the words traditional or contemporary, once again, just as we said, traditional is a very shifting word, contemporary as well. Most churches, uh, particularly uh, for example, at Coral Ridge, the style of contemporary music was really more a product of the 70s and early 80s, if you think about it. It's certainly uh, not a product of, you know, this century, for, for example. So it's when you make these statements, it's a little bit nebulous and it really is not terribly helpful because there's good music and bad music from all times. So how do we measure it? Well, the criteria by which music and hymnody of the past were evaluated, uh, because those have been tossed aside by the saying that it's simply old. But why? God creates a newborn child, but he also created the Grand Canyon. So there is an entire universe, and there is good and, uh, in, in all things, in all generations, and also things that are not so good. So God's creativity and our creativity should not be measured by time or cultural relevance. If that were the case, the Bible would not be appropriate in our time either because it is not viewed as ethically relevant to our culture. That's what our, cu our culture screams at us. So how do we determine what the standard is for our music in the church? Simply put, it should be the best that we can offer with our gifts. We can, of course, judge the, judge the texts of our hymns from a biblical perspective. When it comes to aesthetics of the music we use, it should be the best that we can create. In Exodus, uh, we read of God's directives for the Old Testament temple worship. There, I think we are struck by the intricate detail which God prescribes for everything in tabernacle worship. Listen here to what God describes for the holy anointing oil. This is amazing. This is Exodus 30, 22 to 30. 
Quote, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, also take for yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much sweet smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels of sweet smelling cane, 500 shekels of casia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hin of olive oil. And you shall make from these a holy anointing oil, an ointment compound according to the art of the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tabernacle of the meeting, the ark of the testimony, the table and all its utensils, the lampstand and its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with its utensils, and the laver and its base. You shall consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they minister to me as priests. So as God was establishing his tabernacle, this is the first time, remember, that as, as the Old Testament moves along, you have the tabernacle and then it moves eventually into uh, the temple. You see that God actually spoke and directed what he wanted in his worship. So obviously this, we are in the new covenant and we don't do this, but, but we do see from this that God takes very seriously what is offered in his worship. The God of the Old Testament has not changed. He still requires that we offer the best, our first fruits. We live in a time when it is assumed that as long as our intentions are good, God does not care if we don't prepare properly and offer him our best. First of all, I would disagree that we are giving him uh, our best, but we have developed a view of God that he's just happy uh, in a sense that we show up on Sunday morning. Unfortunately, that really is the case. Listen here to what God said to the prophet Micah in regards to the Israelites uh, later on in the Old Testament who were not offering the best sheep for the temple sacrifice. This is Malachi 1.14. But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nation. So what was happening? The people were deceiving and they were, you know, they had better sheep in their flock. And so rather than give the best to the Lord, they were giving animals with blemishes and keeping the best for themselves. And uh, that's human nature. We all do this to one degree or another. We must remember that God is a holy God and he expects the best of what we can offer. So does that mean every church should offer the same level of music? The standard is what God wants our best. Think of ourselves here. I, I love the faithfulness, for example, on Saturdays when I see uh, our faithful volunteers setting up the chairs. They, have, they line everything up with a two by four. You have the coons going and making sure the hymnals are pointing all in the same direction. You know, these attentions to detail. Yes, we are meeting in a gymnasium, which is what God has given us. He, ha does, he hasn't given us stained glass windows right now, so he doesn't require that from us. But he does require that we do, we do our best. And so I think you, he looks at the heart and he sees that from, you know, what is, what is the scripture? Um, to whom much is given, much is required. And in our case, we're a fledgling church. So he requires from us that we come together uh, and we do the best uh, with what we have been given. Now, this next topic here uh, in regards to uh, music is, is obviously personal, but you'll have to give me a moment. Uh, we live in a time um, when the church tends to be biased against uh, people who are trained. Um, less about pastors, but also that's also the case. You hear on television uh, ministers who are quite proud of the fact that they haven't been to seminary, you know. Um, it's sort of the, the reaction to previous generations, we think of the, some of the great pastors of a generation or two ago, and of course our, our own Dr. Kennedy, who for them education was an Im, Im, important thing. So the pendulum has swung the other way. You know, you can be prideful in your education, you can also be prideful in your ignorance. That's also possible. You can be proud of your humility even, right? You can be so conscious about showing yourself to be humble when in reality is that you're doing it for false motives. And the same thing has happened in regards uh, to other people in the church and certainly with mu musicians. Um, there's a sense today that in our casual society that someone who is trained in music 
uh, you know, perhaps is not able to relate. And, and I, don't, I don't agree with that. And it's sad that in the evangelical church that there is a bias against that. And what you're left with is uh, it's the liberal churches who don't believe in scripture who have made an idol out of music and the staff that they have. So it's, it's an extreme and it should be somewhat in between for us. And in this church obviously uh, has placed a high priority on its staff uh, and John and I are of course very blessed to, to be on staff here at the church. Uh, listen to the music program that uh, King David set up for uh, the temple that he, that he created. And this is in 1 Chronicles 25. David and the captains of the army separated for the service some of the sons of Asaph, these were the Levites, you remember, of Haman and uh, Jeduthun, who should, interesting, prophesy with harps, stringed instruments, and cymbals. So interesting, they weren't just making music, they were actually prophesying. All of these were under the direction of their father for the music in the house of the Lord with cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps for the service of the house of God. So the number of them with their brethren were instructed in the songs of the Lord, all who were skillful. It was 288. So you see that in the Old Testament, there was a requirement of skill and that there was also an education that was taking place, a passing on uh, the knowledge. You heard the father teaching the sons. Uh, and this, this uh, is very much uh, part of a concept that I am developing right now with, uh, at, at our church, and we will implement it when the time is right, of a school of fine arts where we train young and old alike in music and art and drama, and that we use that to raise up the next generation of church musicians and worshipers. And so we as a church really must focus on uh, teaching and training. You think about, we're very conscious of for example, in scripture where it talks about the older women teaching the younger. The same thing goes for, for everything in our churches, that we should uh, not be elitist about what we have, but we should be giving it away. And that's very important for any of us who have been blessed with ex expertise in, in anything, whether it's teaching or uh, music or any, any number of things. So uh, John uh, quoted uh, from the temple worship and how grand it was when he talked about uh, all of the trumpeters and the singers, and so I won't quote that again. But you do see in that passage there that when all of this music was presented to God, uh, that he was pleased, and it says, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house. So we know that God takes great joy uh, in, in our praise. And that's, that's our foremost goal and what we should be doing in life is praising God. So what is the role of music in worship as we begin to focus down here? John uh, mentioned that briefly and I will go through more detail. It is based upon biblical evidence. Music properly fills three roles in the context of worship. It's praise, prayer, and proclamation. Worship music as praise. There is no question that worship music is used to praise God. Some people think of all the elements of worship as praise, even though music uh, may fulfill many different roles. It's not just praise alone. In scripture, we have the Psalms, of course, uh, from the Old Testament. Uh, they were the principal hymnal for God's people of for thousands of years. And in our Reformed tradition, uh, psalm singing is very important. We don't do as much of it in our modern evangelical uh, Presbyterian circles, but uh, we may, may want to consider singing. Some churches will sing a psalm at every single uh, service, and that's, that, that is the primary hymnal of the Bible. Uh, we also have uh, canticles. Those are singing hymns of praise. Uh, you find uh, those throughout the Bible. Uh, Moses and Miriam, uh, they sang after Pharaoh parted the Red Sea. Uh, of course, David sang uh, to the Lord as he was delivered from his enemies and from Saul. And Mary sang, the most famous is uh, the when Mary sang when Elizabeth came and sang uh, what we know as the Magnificat, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And throughout history, there's wonderful pieces that have been written on that, both uh, modern and old. We also uh, have hymns of Christ in scripture. Uh, and these are uh, texts that focus on the worship and the attributes uh, of God. 
uh, and uh, the father and more overtly uh, than perhaps those of the, the son. So the hymns of Christ tend to, uh, to focus on that. And then we have uh, hymns in our tradi English tradition by Isaac Watts, who he took psalms and made paraphrases of them and, and changed the text in the sense where he showed that how they were fulfilled in the, uh, the New Testament, in the New Covenant. So in a sense, he Christianized them in that he continued on <clears throat> with them. Of course, in the New Testament, we have doxologies, <clears throat> uh, and they can, uh, you know, encompass the full gamut of praise to God. So, okay, so now what we talk about, so let's move to music uh, in worship as prayer. Remember we said that most often music is viewed as praise, but it can also be prayer. It's an important role in worship. Uh, subconsciously, we tend to put singing and prayer in separate categories. Uh, maybe this is done because singing is done with our eyes open and prayer is done with them closed. Um, but any communication with God is prayer. It can be spoken, sung, written, or thought. The reason that this delineation has risen over time is, is hard to determine. However, the rise of music uh, as entertainment in church is certainly contributes to this view. How, how often do you hear people, for example, applaud for a prayer? I haven't, se I haven't seen it. I've seen a temp one, I was at, <laughs> I was at one Westminster um, chapel. I think I actually heard that done. I remember thinking, that's kind of odd. <laughs> but th th those, were, uh, those were kids. Those were kids. <laughs> I remember being shy, like, that's odd. But uh, anyway. Uh, but normally, in our, even in our clapping society, uh, we, don't, we don't applaud for prayer. Um, so because of the way our society is, we are a consumer society, uh, you know, music in the services become some uh, type of entertainment, uh, sadly. Uh, and so, you know, it is important that we view our music not only as praise, but also prayer. So, for example, um, when you are listening to the choir anthem and you look at the text, many times those are prayers. So rather than sitting there observing and just enjoying, think about that text and actually praying that text, you know, giving assent to it and meditating on it. That's, that's why it's important for us to put the text in the bulletins uh, so that you can actually pray along with the choir as it sings. So what are the implications uh, of all of these choices that we have to make, whether they're intentional or they just happen uh, by chance? Most pastors uh, have little musical training uh, today, and there's little instruction in the seminaries. And so I, would, I believe that most of the problems we have in the church ultimately stem from seminaries and sort of the lack of, of training in music. And, all of us, when we don't know a subject, tend to be a bit insecure about it. And I can tell you in all my years working with ministers that uh, those who are uneducated in it tend to be uh, the most uh, freaked out by it and don't know what to do with it. And so they just kind of go along with what everyone else is doing rather than, you know, you don't have to be a great singer. You don't have to be able to play the piano, but that doesn't mean that you can't really engage and understand what, uh, what music should be. Uh, in, in your books here, Paul Jones has a, a section uh, that he writes, and he's obviously a, a very opinionated. Uh, you have to be to write books. And, uh, but I really like this paragraph, these two paragraphs here, and I'd like to read them. This is about uh, the modern church, um, talking about megachurches and the, you know, the church growth experts. And this is what he says. In hopes of bringing increased vitality to the church, contemporary services are added with hymns often emoted or excluded from worship. This flawed approach comes from the mistaken belief that growth in church attendance on the basis of popular musical styles ensures spiritual growth. Another mistaken notion is that worship music's purpose is to attract the unsaved and then the teaching ministry will take care of the rest. That's a very important statement he just made there, and it's, it's the root of, of our seeker-friendly model. A third is that such changes are necessary for the young people. At the root of these errors is the idea that worship music is predominantly a tool for evangelism. 
Reformed churches with conservative doctrine in their preaching ministry often dumb down their music in an attempt to make services more palatable or accessible to people. They may not do this with the preaching, but they will with music. Many pastors and churches would like to have good music, but they are willing to sacrifice it as long as the pulpit ministry is strong. This creates a double standard in our message. The gospel power of worship music is denied, and we wind up depriving our congregations of the rich depths of vibrant biblical music ministry. Is it possible that our actions declare that what we offer people is more important than what we offer God? Remember, what is the concept? What, is our, what are our worship services for? Who are they for? Are they evangelism tools? Are they fellowship tools? Or are they foremost that we are coming together to offer the God of the universe our praise? That's an important concept to really understand. Another error suggests that we are responsible for producing new means or methods to build the church, that we have to package the gospel in postmodern clothing. God builds his church through the faithful preaching of his word and the biblical worship of his people. God's ways are timeless, unchanging, and true. We must, be, must meaningfully interact with people immersed in pop popular culture, yes, but we do not have to take on its character or speak with its trendy musical accents. So often when this is attempted, when we try to sound fashionable, the result is an inferior version of what the world does and therefore scoffs at us. In fact, the more different worship music is from popular culture, the clearer the alternative it offers to those seeking depth, peace, truth, and hope in a dark, pagan, and pluralistic uh, consumer age. Now we move to worship music as proclamation. We're getting close to our closing time here. In present day evangelical churches, most of the elements in worship service are considered as a preamble to the sermon. Music in particular appears to be a lighter element of worship, but that is not the case. Music really does proclaim scripture. Uh, this is what Luther said, uh, and then I'm gonna wrap up. Do you, do you have closing comments that you need to make? Yeah, okay. So I'll. I'll close here in a second. This is what Martin Luther said about uh, church music uh, and its teaching and preaching ability. He said, God has his gospel preached through music. Music and notes, which are wonderful gifts and creations of God, do help gain a better understanding of text, especially when sung by a congregation and when sung earnestly. God is praised and honored, and we are made str better and stronger in faith when his holy word is impressed on our hearts by sweet music. So singing, which is what God has ordained for his people to do, when they are singing the word of God, that increases its value, and certainly for children. Think about yourselves, if you grew, in a, grew up in a Christian home, the, the music, how it has engraved scripture upon your heart. Think about, I think, growing up in vacation Bible school, the different little songs that you sang, or the memory verses. Uh, Psalm 1 is still engraved in my memory uh, because we, we not only memorize it, but we sang it. And so that's really very, very critical uh, for us to understand the role of music as uh, teaching and, and learning God's word. So in conclusion, uh, what is worship music? It is praise, prayer, and proclamation in musical form conform to biblical principles. What is it not? It is not man-focused, self-indulgent entertainment for utilitarian or pragmatic purposes. In order for church music to serve the wor and the worship of God properly and biblically, we must follow these principles. We must measure our worship practices by the word of God. We need to comprehend the pastoral nature of music ministry and what it does for our congregations. And we should ensure that our practices are informed and patterned after the Bible and what it teaches us.